On page 02, uh, what we uh, summarized uh, after the lab test was uh, the major phyla that we are going to present uh, in the animal kingdom. Uh, remember, we divide kingdoms into phylums. And uh, we mentioned, and I'll, I'll, I will review this much, what are the principal phylum? Uh, so there are phylum periphera, those are the sponges. And uh, we're going to tell you more about these in just a moment. And of course, how they get the name periphera is because sponges have all these pores, periphera. Uh, then there's phylum salenterata or nidaria, either term is acceptable. And these include the sea anemones, or if you watched Finding Nemo, the anemone, 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 anemones. And uh, the jellyfish and the coral, we'll have more to say about those. Uh, it includes a third phylum, phy phylum platy helminthes. Platy means flat, like plata or plate means flatware. And helminth means worms. Those are the flatworms. And they include the tapeworms, which you probably have heard of. Uh, then there's phylum nematoda. Those are the so-called round worms, which include uh, pinworms and the trichinosis worm, if you've heard of those. Uh, another, uh, and those uh, phylum that we just mentioned are commonly known as the lower invertebrates, the simplest of all animals. Then we have the higher invertebrates. They include a fascinating phylum called mollusca, the mollusks. And most of the mollusks, as we will be learning, are characterized by having shells, although not all of them have shells. They include snails and slugs, and obviously a snail has a shell, but a slug does not. They include clams and mussels and scallops, which have shells. And they include the octopus and squid and something called the nautilus, which has a shell. We'll have more to say about those. And then there's phylum annelida. The annelids are the segmented worms. They have a lot of body segments, and that includes the earthworms, and also, as we'll be learning, the leeches. Uh, and then the, uh, there's the phylum arthropoda. Now, uh, we've heard the word arthritis. That means inflammation of our joints. Arthro means joints. Poda, like podiatrist, is foot, like a foot doctor, podiatrist. So literally, jointed feet. And they have all these jointed legs. And that's what, uh, that includes crabs, which have all those jointed legs, and lobsters, spiders, and scorpions, and insects all have these jointed legs. And then uh, the last of the so-called invertebrates are phylum echinodermata. Echino means spiny, and dermata, like a dermatologist, is skin, so spiny skin. And these include uh, the starfish, or sea star, the sea urchins, and so on, that are characterized by having spiny skin. The last phylum is the phylum vertebrata. Those are the vertebrates. Those are the animals that have a vertebral column, or spine, that we're most familiar with. And uh, we'll get into all of those as well. So uh, what I want to do, beginning on page 03, is we're going to go through in a little bit more detail and tell you a little bit more about uh, these different phylum of animals. Now, uh, the main thing that I, I'm going to emphasize on this, there's a lot of information here. Uh, in general, I'm focusing on what's underlined. And I've highlighted that. And if I haven't underlined or highlighted it, you probably don't need to know it. All right? So I'm trying to just, as you start to review the, the notes. So let's start with the first phylum, phylum periphera. Uh, the word periphera means to have pores, openings, and these include the sponges. The sponges, and when we think of a sponge, we think of something like this, are the most primitive of all animals. They don't move. They just kind of sit at the bottom of uh, a body of water, usually the ocean, sometimes a lake, and they just sit there and they filter the water. So this is kind of what a sponge looks like here, and again, uh, we'll have the specimens out, and there's a, a, a video that shows this, a lot better than me trying to project it here. But uh, this, is, this is just shows an example of a sponge. Very, very primitive animals. Uh, they have no organ systems. They are sessile. 
But what does sesso mean? Sesso means they don't move. They simply stay in place. They're stationary. They don't move. You'd say, did you say that? They do not move. There it is. They're sessile uh, or stationary. And they are filter feeders. They filter the water. Now, uh, so in this uh, picture, it just shows how uh, water flows in through these openings or pores of the sponge. And uh, it filters food out of the water, and that's how it lives. It's a filter feeder. Uh, now, uh, these uh, sponges have a, an internal skeleton. So when you see a, something like this, and you say that's a sponge, what you're looking at is the internal skeleton. In real life, it would be covered by living cells. Now, just as an analogy, uh, so this is the internal skeleton of a human. Obviously, in real life, we're covered by flesh. We've got cells. So uh, if you're looking at just the skeleton, this is not the actual person. Uh, but you get a sense of what a person looks like just from the basic shape of the internal skeleton. Similarly, this is the internal skeleton of a sponge. It's actually made up of a protein called spongin. And uh, in real life, it would be covered by flesh, by cells. And uh, it would just be sitting there filtering water. Again, in this bottle is an actual preserved sponge where uh, it's covered still by cells and so on. So I'm just trying to explain uh, what uh, when you pick up a sponge. Incidentally, the majority of sponges that are sold in the market, you know, they're usually kind of rectangular, square shaped, and they're pink or, or you know blue. Those are artificial sponges. They're not real sponges. Uh, they do sell like at Home Depot uh, and so on. Uh, real sponges that are like this. And really, if you were washing your car. Nothing works better than a real sponge as far as absorbing water and so on that, you know, these artificial sponges can't compare to a, a real sponge. But again, what, is, what we're calling a sponge is just the internal skeleton. And on page 04, on 04 at the top, we said that that internal skeleton is made up of a protein called spongin. That's easy enough to remember. Sounds like it's something in a sponge. Now, uh, we wrote that sponges reproduce primarily by asexual budding. What does that mean? Uh, let's just look up back on the previous page. And on the previous page, the way that sponges reproduce is new baby sponges simply grow right off the body of the parent. You know, in, in many, many ways, when you look at this sponge, it almost seems more like a plant than an animal. It doesn't move and it just kind of forms new baby sponges right off its body. So some of you might even be thinking, yeah, so why isn't it a plant? Because it doesn't carry on photosynthesis. It doesn't, uh, it, it's not a, a plant-like, the basic characteristic of plants is that they carry on photosynthesis. This uh, needs to feed on food. It feeds on uh, things that it filters out of the water. It's a heterotroph, it's an animal. Uh, and uh, so it doesn't, uh, the cells don't have chloroplasts, it has no chlorophyll and so on. Uh, all right, so much for phylum periphera. That's all we want you to know. Uh, on the bottom of page 04, the next phylum is phylum selenorata or nidaria. Either term is okay with me. Now, the, uh, of course, you might say, I don't like either term. Well, you know what, neither do I. We might ask, what do we call it in English? The in common English word for these animals are selenorates. That's the word in the English dictionary. Right? So you may not have heard of that before, but that's what they're called. So uh, I, when I call them selenorata, that's in English, they're selenorates. Uh, the, sci the real scientific name that's used today is nidaria, C-N-I-D-A-R-I-A. -I -I but either, I'll accept either term. Now, who are they? They are the jellyfish, the corals, the sea anemone, anemone anemones. There's 10,000 species of them, and I'm only going to cover about 8,390. No, we're just going to mention a couple, as we always do. They are all marine. What does marine mean? They live in the ocean. And they are characterized by having tentacles, radial symmetry, 
And, uh, uh, and then I mentioned some other characteristics. Before I go through those other characteristics, which I've underlined and highlighted, let's look at a picture on the next page, O5. Because the selenerates come in two basic shapes. The selenerates either look like, basically like this or like this. What do you notice about these two shapes? The Don't they just look like upside down versions of the same thing? Yes. So uh, the selenerates that look like this are called a polyp shape, and that includes a C and M and M and M and E. It looks like this. And those that have this shape are called a medusa shape. That's like a jellyfish. So they are really kind of upside down versions of the same thing. Now, there are some differences and there's some similarities. Uh, the similarities is whether they look like this, like a sea anemone, or like this, like a jellyfish. They have an, one opening. And that, uh, that opening is both a mouth and an anus, or a proctostome. And if you were here for when I lectured after the lab test last time, I mentioned that, an anal mouth. So the, it, it basically takes its tentacles, stuffs the food into this opening, it digests the food, and whatever it can't digest, it spits out that same opening, so it's both a mouth and an anus. It's called a proctostome. Some of you know, might know that a doctor who deals with uh, problems with your rectum is called a proctologist. So... Uh, it literally practice stone. Stone means mouth, so it's a literally a rectal mouth, an anal mouth. Uh, yep. Do they ever flip? Like. Yeah, it gets more complicated as far as their life cycle. Yes, it gets more complicated. But, but we're just trying to keep it simple. Now, uh, on the uh, uh, the tentacles, there are nematocysts, and those are stinger cells. Uh, I wrote the word out, but it's actually underlined, and I highlighted it right here. So it actually can use its tentacles to sting its prey, what it feeds on. In the case of the jellyfish, which has these stinger cells or nematocysts, have you ever heard of like divers being stung by a jellyfish? Yeah. All right, so that uh, they have these stinger cells. They, uh, uh, in most cases, it's just an, uh, the st being stung by a jellyfish is uh, hurts, uh, but you don't usually die from it. But it is enough for a small little fish or something to really stun it, and uh, then it just eats it. Now, uh, the difference between, in general, the selenerates that have this shape and this shape, shape, these are called polyp shape, and they are sessile. They don't move. A sea anemone, just if, does everybody know what a sea anemone is? They, if they find them attached to rocks along a rocky shore, you can see them uh, around Malibu, if you ever go to uh, the Malibu, uh, uh, the, the uh, coastal park in Malibu, or if you go down to uh, uh, the uh, Pacific, uh, Palos Verdes Peninsula, down to the uh, rocky area, you'll see sea anemones and starfish and so on. Anyhow, so they don't move, and they reproduce asexually. They just form little buds right off their body, and we'll show you that in a moment. Those that have this shape, like the jellyfish, are free swimming. They swim around. Jellyfish are swimming around in the uh, ocean. And they reproduce sexually. So uh, that's uh, back on the previous uh, page, 04. So on 04, we had mentioned uh, that um, there are the, uh, the polyp shapes uh, have the, are sessile and reproduce asexually, the medusa. Uh, reproduce uh, sexually. They do, uh, the, another important characteristic of uh, the selenerates is they have radial symmetry. And we explained that last week after the test. They, uh, their body shape is organized like the spokes of a wheel uh, rather than bilateral like us. The human, we can divide ourselves into a right and left half. But for them, you can't. Um, okay, uh, on page uh, 06, on 06, so the only thing that I'd like you to know on 06 is here on the top left of 06, it shows some jellyfish. And uh, you'll notice that it refers to them as medusae because we say that shape is called a medusa shape. And they swim around in the ocean, and there's actually male and female jellyfish. And they, uh, the male releases sperm and the female releases eggs into the ocean, 
and then the sperm unites with the egg and it forms, you know, babies. And I'm not going to get into the details of how all this all works. It's more complicated than what I'm making it out to be. All right, so all you have to know is a jellyfish is an example of a Medusa-shaped saline ring. Uh, on page uh, 07, on 07, An 07 is a picture of a polyp-shaped selenerate. Mm -hmm. And this happens to be a selenerate called Hydra. And uh, it's, you'll notice this one is it's like an upside-down version of the jellyfish. It's the shape like a sea anemone. Uh, and uh, the main thing to notice here is can you see a baby budding right off the body of the parent? Because we said the polyp-shaped selenerates uh, usually are sessile, they don't move, and they reproduce by asexual budding, as opposed to sexual reproduction. Again, there are variations on this. <coughs> Bless you. So, uh, all we're trying to show you is some of these weird animals. Now, on page 08, on 08, there are also what are called colonial selenerates. Colonial polyps, I should say, colonial polyps. And uh, what is a colonial polyp? It's a whole colony of polyp-shaped selenerates. So can everybody see that this is like a shape like a polyp shape, a, a sea anemone? And there's a whole bunch of them. And uh, that forms a whole colony. Let me show you a picture. And the picture I'm going to show you is on another video that I have made showing you the animals. Can you see that's like a whole colony of little polyp-shaped selenerates? Uh, th this would be a, a, like a colony of sea anemones. And this is also what coral looks like. Now, we've all heard the word coral. So when we think of coral, you know, you can go to, uh, you know, uh, stores like on uh, Santa Monica Pier, you know, or Redondo Beach Pier. And they always have sh stores that sell shells and coral and stuff like that. And we wonder, what the heck is that? Well, this, there's nothing alive about this. But in the, there's, when you look carefully at coral, there's little tiny holes. And what used to live in these tiny holes of this coral are these guys, these little polyp-shaped selenerates. And they actually secrete this cal calcium carbonate around them to protect them. So this structure here is actually secreted by them. Just like a, a snail has a shell and a turtle has a shell, and incidentally we have nails that form off our body. So this just forms, it secretes this kind of calcium uh, mineral around itself to protect it, and uh, that's, that's called coral. It's really a huge colony of, of these tiny, really tiny, microscopic sized uh, 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 polyp shaped selenerates. Uh, now, some of us have heard this term coral reef. What's a coral reef? So, this, imagine uh, this colony of polyp shaped selenerates that start, they're on the bottom of the ocean, and they just, th they just grab food out of the water using their tentacles. And each generation, the next generation that forms, grows right on top of the previous generation. And the next generation grows on top of them. And the next generation grows on top of them. Each generation is secreting this rock-like calcium mineral around them. So this coral is going over generation after generation. It's rising higher and higher in the ocean. Over the course of millions of years, it reaches the surface of the ocean. It takes millions of years, all those generations. And then you've got this island that's called a coral reef. And so it is literally formed by this colony of coral that, that took uh, over thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years. Uh, it, it rose in the ocean and finally reached the surface of the ocean. And that's it. They'll uh, get expanded back into the ocean again. They can't live in the air. So uh, that's what a coral reef is. And so I will put out, uh, we'll have a, a microscope showing you uh, uh, the, uh, this uh, colony of polyps. But uh, we wanted you to understand what coral is. So in effect, on the next page, on 09, I just underlined stony coral. 
Sometimes they'll use the word stony coral because coral kind of forms this rock-like mineral around itself. And we'll put out, we've got a few examples of these things. So just in terms of summarizing then, uh, before we move forward, we said that uh, on page 05, we had said on page 05 that the selenerates uh, have come in two basic shapes, either this shape or this shape. Uh, what's an example of, of uh, selenerates that look like this? Sea anemones, hydra, coral. What's an example of selenerates that have this shape? A medusa say jellyfish, kind of an upside down version. So that's kind of uh, fascinating, I guess. Uh, on, uh, the, on, the, uh, on page uh, o 10, o 010, so on page o 010, the next phylum, the third phylum, is platyhelminthes. It literally means flat worms. And uh, there's a whole bunch, these are also pretty primitive. And I'm just going to mention two examples of flat worms, platy helminthes. Uh, a planaria and a tapeworm. This is a planaria. And it lives in uh, lakes and streams. Uh, and it's uh, most character noticeable, recognizable, that it looks cross-eyed. It, it doesn't really have true eyes. It has eye spots that are sensitive to light. So it can tell light from dark, that's it. It doesn't see the world the way we see the world with an image. It just can tell light from dark. So this is already a more advanced, quote, animal, advanced animal than the selenerates, which, you know, were jellyfish or uh, sea anemones. Uh, it does have a proctostome, just like the selenerates, You'd say, what's that? An anal mouth. It doesn't have a separate mouth and a separate anus. The food is taken up through here, and then it poops out whatever it can't use out the same opening. And so uh, they, they just feed on food that's in lakes and streams. All right, so that's a flat worm, and they are really, really flat. And then uh, on page uh, O, we're going to jump to page O13. On O13, and anything I skip, I won't test you on. I will not. Only what I'm covering. So on O13, the intestinal tapeworm of man. Now, uh, I'm sure we've all heard the word tapeworms. A tapeworm is also a really flat worm. Here's a bottle with a tapeworm in it. They are very flat. That's why they belong to the phylum flatworm or platyhelminthes. And uh, it's not, uh, tapeworms are a parasite, and they live in the intestinal tract. They can be in a human intestine. They can be in a dog's intestine or a cat. So if you've got a pet, they can have worms, you know, tapeworms and so on. So uh, they are a parasite. To understand them a little bit better, uh, so I wrote all tapeworms are parasites that live in the intestinal tract of a host. And the tapeworm absorbs nourishment directly through their body surface. Now, there's usually what's called an intermediate host. And in the case of the intestinal tapeworm of man, the intermediate host is actually a cow. We can see this on the next page, on O14. So on O14, we'll tell you a little bit about tapeworms. An exciting subject. You'll notice, first of all, at the very top, I wrote some tapeworms may reach up to 36 feet long in humans. All right, here's how this works. First of all, let's imagine that this guy has a tapeworm in his intestinal tract. Okay? What does it look like? It looks like this. That's the tapeworm. Now, the front end of the tapeworm is called the scolex. I mean, we would, we would tend to call it the head. But it's not like it's got a head like our head. It's, it's called a scolex, and it's got hooks and suckers. And it uses the hooks and suckers to attach to the wall of your intestine. This is a fun subject, isn't it? Right. Now, um, now, what it does is this uh, uh, attached to the scolex are increasing numbers of proglottids. And it keeps forming more and more proglottids, which make it grow longer and longer. Now, what are proglottids?
Proglottids, each, in each proglottid, they're like uh, reproductive machines. You'll notice that in each proglottid, there is both a testes and an ovary in each proglottid. So in other words, it's a hermaphrodite. And basically, it fertilizes its eggs, and then it forms these eggs. And so the proglottid is just filled with a bunch of eggs. All right, so what is a tapeworm when we look at it? So the fr very front end is a scolix that has hooks and suckers to attach to the wall of the intestine. And the rest of it, uh, of its length, is just these repeating segments of proglottids, which are simply designed to produce a lot of eggs. Now, uh, how do you get a tapeworm? So let's just say for a moment that I had a tapeworm. I don't, but let's say I did. All right? So uh, this, every time I were to defecate, right, do number two, so in the feces are these uh, uh, proglottids and eggs. So that's what we wrote, is that there's these eggs in the human feces. I wrote that right here. <clears throat> now, in the United States, we don't really have a big tapeworm problem. And most places in the world, there's not a big tapeworm problem. <clears throat> but there's still some places in the world that haven't quite caught up to the global economy of the world. All right? There are places in the world where they don't have flush toilets. Most of the places do have flush toilets. I've traveled through the world when I was much younger, and there was many places even in Europe that didn't have flush toilets, not all that many years ago. But uh, there are places in the world where, let's imagine, that I have, uh, I'm a uh, shepherd. I live in a place in the world where I have my herd of cattle, and uh, I'm, they're grazing, and I kind of watch over my herd of cattle or cows, right? And uh, sometimes you got to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Now, just imagine if I have this tapeworm, and you know, there's no flush toilets. I'm out in the, you know, hillsides that, where the uh, uh, cattle are pasturing or, or feeding on grass, so I gotta go. So I'm just gonna, you know what, I'm just gonna squat right here and, and, and take a dump, as they say, do number two, uh, right there on the grass, right just in the field. There's not a lot of traffic, I'll just do that. Now, cows are not all that different from dogs. If you own a dog, you know that a dog will lick almost anything. Is that right? If you threw up, the dog will lick your vomit. Is that right? The dog will greet, go into a garbage can and eat whatever's there. Is that right? They'll eat anything. They'll lick anything. If you spit on the floor, they'll sniff it and lick it. If you don't have a pet, you don't know that, but that's what they do. So the cows are not all that different. So you know this person defecated here uh, in, the, uh, in the pasture, and there's going to be cows that start grazing and licking. We said there are eggs the tapeworm eggs that are in that feces, and now this cow is eating some of the eggs. So now the cow eats the eggs, and what hatches from the eggs is a baby tapeworm called a larva. So now this larva is in the body of the cow. We say the cow is the intermediate host. Now, let's say that, uh, we, that we're gonna go and uh, 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 we're going to sell this cow, we're going to slaughter the cow, because people want to have some hamburgers and steaks. All right? So now, remember that what's in that cow's body are these larval or, or, or juvenile tapeworms. Now, actually, if you were to cook the meat well, you'll kill these larvae. But you know, a lot of people, when you're having, especially like a filet mignon and something uh, like that, people will like it rare. Some people like it blood red on the inside. In fact, there are some people, if you go to a fancy French restaurant, they sell a very expensive uh, dish called steak tatar. Anybody know what steak tatar is? That's raw steak. Now, we can eat raw, I'm not telling you not to eat raw steak, uh, because we have pretty good confidence that the cattle that we're eating, the meat we're eating, doesn't have tapeworms in it. But, uh, you know, we're raising them here, and people are not defecating out in the fields normally where the cattle are grazing. But if you're eating meat from some place in the world where you're not totally 
you know, confident of exactly what the sanitary conditions are of how they raise their livestock, you should, if you're going to eat the meat at all, make sure it's well, it's cooked well to kill the larva. Let's say it, then some, you, somebody eats this uh, steak, this hamburger, likes it uh, rare, right? Doesn't want to cook it too much, and now then they eat that, and that larva now starts growing into this big tapeworm in their body. Does everybody see how you get it? Mm -hmm. So we say the cow is the intermediate host, and the human is the final host. The, uh, it, the, uh, ha it has to go from human to cow to human. Now, the, the evolutionary biologists would explain the reason why it works this way is that before humans were here on the planet, there were cows before us. That's true whether you go by the evolutionary account or the biblical account. We're the last ones to appear in either account. And so originally, this was just a parasite of the cow. But then when humans started raising and eating cows, so then we get, became part of this cycle, is the explanation. All right, so uh, we've talked about a tapeworm, and uh, here at the bottom we've mentioned the scolex with the hooks and suckers and what the proglottids are. So we've talked about two types of flatworms, a planaria and a tapeworm. The planaria is not a parasite, it just feeds on food in the water. Now that takes us to page uh, O15. On, uh, incidentally, on the top of O15, on the top of O15, I mentioned that the, the best way to make sure you don't end up with a tapeworm is number one, don't eat infected meat that is improperly cooked. So if you suspect that the meat might have parasites in it, if you're going to eat it, make sure you cook it well or don't eat it at all. But mo even more importantly, number two, don't ever put human waste wherever you grow plant vet vegetables or crops and don't put human waste, feces, where you raise livestock. You know, we... Um, the, uh, we use fertilizers on our plants and so on, and we even use steer manure and stuff like that. That's okay. We never put human manure as a fertilizer, but they do in some places in the world. We don't, because that's what creates the parasitic cycle. We never put human waste on anything where we're going to get food from. We don't want, where, uh, if we're going to fish the oceans and get fish out of the ocean, we should not dump raw human feces into our lakes and streams and ocean. So that's why when you flush the toilet, it goes to a sewage treatment plant. And they use bacteria to decompose and break down all the feces and so on. And basically it is treated and totally eliminated from having parasites before it's released out into the ocean. That's called sewage treatment. Now that's what's done in all more advanced societies, but it's not done everywhere in the world, and where it's not done, you get more parasites. Right? And so uh, we would, should never have human waste wherever we have either plants, crops, or livestock. Okay, that's what creates these cycles. So that's the big issue. Uh, okay, let's talk about the fourth phylum, the nematodes. These are the roundworms. These were the first animals to actually have a mouth and an anus. All right, well, this really doesn't look like a real roundworm, but uh, the point is it's just showing that it's got a mouth and it's got an anus, all right? So it comes out the other end. All the other animals up until this point had proctostomes. They had an anal mouth. They had just one opening that did both, both things. So uh, mouth and anus. All right, now, uh, I'm just going to give you two examples of uh, these guys, uh, the roundworms. There is on page 016, on 016, there's a picture of a uh, roundworm. And uh, you'll notice that at the bottom of 016, uh, it shows that uh, some of these roundworms kind of have a hook. And if you've ever heard of a hookworm, that's another parasite, and it's got this kind of hook shape to it. It lives in the intestinal tract, just mentioning it. But they, really, the two roundworms that I'm going to ask you to know, they're on O17. On O17, I want to just mention pinworms and the trichinosis worm. These are parasites. 
Has anybody ever heard of pinworms? Anybody? Nobody? Now, these, the, a pinworm is in the United States. It's not a big deal. Not, it doesn't cause any death or anything. But it is a, a, a still a, a fairly common uh, parasite that uh, kids will get. And uh, let me explain what it is. The pinworm's a little tiny round worm, and it lives around the rectum. And, uh, and it comes out at night when like, the, the person's asleep. These are usually kids. And it comes out, and uh, it deposits its eggs right around the anus. So uh, it causes itching. And so this, and kids who have this pinworms are like always scratching their butt. <laughs> Which a lot of kids who scratch their butt all the time, anyhow. But they, it causes it to itch. And so it, some of you may have heard that if you see your, your kid with it, there's always scratching their butt, they will tell you when they're asleep, you know, pull down their pajamas, take some scotch tape, sticky tape, and put it around their anus and just bring the tape into the doctor and they will see if there's eggs. Has anybody ever heard of anything I'm saying? No. Nobody has heard any of this? No. All right. Anyhow, so th this is the, where you bring in to see if there's any of these uh, pinworm eggs. Uh, the, uh, how do you get it? You know, how did the kid get it? Uh, this just goes from person to person. Uh, here's how it works. Let's imagine you've got Bobby and Billy. Bobby and Billy are best buddies at school. All right, and it's lunchtime, and they open up their lunch box, they open up their uh, lunch sack, all right, and they're eating lunch, and Bobby, one of them's got pinworms, he's constantly scratching his butt, all right? So then uh, Billy goes, oh, wow, you got chocolate chip cookies, can I have one? And Bobby says, sure, wait a second. He scratches his butt, and he picks up these eggs that are like on his clothes and so on. They're microscopic, you need a magnifying lens to see them. And then he picks up the cookie and hands it, hands it to his best friend, Billy. All right, Billy now eats the cookie, and there's the pinworm eggs on it. So again, here's the basic lesson as far as these parasites. Again, we don't have too much problem with parasites for the following reason. We know that before we eat, we, if we go and we scratch our butt, or we go to the bathroom, we wash our hands with soap and water. That's called good hygiene. It's called sanitation. And we know how to do, we know we're supposed to do it, and we do it in general. There are places in the world where they don't have a high standard of good hygiene and sanitation. So when people, and I've mentioned this before when we talked about amoebic dysentery. Remember I mentioned that uh, at the uh, restaurants and places where they have food, the employees in their bathrooms have signs that say state law requires all employees wash their hands with soap and water after using the bathroom, right? Mm -hmm. And I ask the question, does everybody who works there wash their hands with soap and water after they go to the bathroom? And the answer is no. So anytime you've got this issue with uh, our fecal matter having possible parasites and transmitting it to other people, so that's why we know we have to wash our hands with soap and water. We may not have any parasites, but somebody else might, and we just have to make sure we separate all this. Some of us know also, you're certainly aware of this, that we know that when you have a cold, right, they tell you don't necessarily shake hands with the person. Because not only are these viruses and parasites spread through the air, but by hand contact. Now again, this is awkward because in our society, shaking hands, especially among men, is kind of the greeting. But you know, I think it's becoming increasingly more accepted that if you say, you know, I got a cold, you know, I don't want you to get it, so just uh, we'll, we'll shake hands, you know, bow to the person. You know, maybe we should accept the, uh, the more Asian approach, you just kind of give a bow uh, as a way of greeting instead of shaking hands or, you know, uh, and there's other people, other cultures, where they give people big kisses and hugs and all that. So, you know, there's, but this does affect transmission of diseases. Doesn't mean we shouldn't be friendly, but. All right, now, uh, the, uh, another, so I mentioned pinworms, trichinosis. Have you ever heard that word? All right, I'll tell you the context. Have you ever heard that for those people who eat pork, that you should make sure pork is cooked well? Has anybody ever heard that? Mm -hmm. Even in the United States. Now, the vast majority of pork is, you know, for those who eat it, it's fine to eat even rare. But even in the United States, they estimate that maybe 5% of the pork, of the pigs, 
uh, that are uh, slaughtered in the United States may be infected with this parasitic worm called the trichinosis worm. And it's a round worm. And so, again, if there's a possibility that there's this parasitic worm in the food you're eating, cooking it well will make sure that you kill it. But, uh, and you need a microscope to see it, a magnifying lens. So uh, that's why even in the United States, they will still recommend that pork be cooked well. The vast majority is fine uh, if you didn't, but you never know. Uh, what does the worm look like on the next page, 018? Uh, it looks like a little round worm kind of coiled up, and you'll see it in the meat when you look with a magnifying lens. And if you eat it and, don't, uh, and you haven't killed it, uh, then the worm is now in you. All right, so we've mentioned a couple of examples of the nematodes, or round worms. And we'll have a, a microscope of that worm out. That takes us to page P1. And on page P1, this is a fascinating phylum of animals called the mollusks. Uh, the word mollusks, or mollusca, on page P1 means soft body. They have a soft body, and that's why most of them have shells to protect them. There are 60,000 species. I'm only going to talk about 33,170 of them. No, I'm just going to mention a few. Now, uh, there are three uh, basic types of mollusks, and they're pictured right here. There are uh, those that look like this. Those are the snails and slugs. There, uh, there are those that look like this. These are the clams, oysters, scallops, and mussels. And there are the, those that look like this, the octopus, the squid, and the chambered nautilus. Let me just tell you a little bit more about them. The first characteristic is their bodies are soft, and most of them, not all, have shells. All right? Now, uh, obviously, we know that a snail has a shell, but a slug looks like a snail, and it doesn't have a shell. And I'm not my favorite creatures. I, I like throwing them in the street and watching cars run. Um, now, uh, notice that a snail has what's called a univalve shell. And you'd say, what is a univalve shell? It's all one shell. It's like this. Everybody see that? It's just one shell. A uni. Uni means one. Now, in contrast, clams, oysters, scallops, and mussels are bivalves. A bivalve means there's two halves to it. This wasn't such a good picture, but a bivalve means there's like two parts to the clam shell. And we've got examples of these where it's called a bivalve. There's two parts. Uh, now, uh, there is uh, some, uh, some of the mollusks that look like an octopus or squid actually also live in a shell. That, that includes the chambered nautilus, and we'll show you a picture of that in a moment. Now, the, uh, this part right here is called the foot, and the fo muscular foot is what it uses for movement. So we've all seen that kind of uh, track that a snail leaves, you know, this kind of mucus track as it kind of crawls along with its muscular foot. The, similarly, a clam or an oyster can stick out this muscular foot and burrow into the sand. Has anybody ever gone clamming, like at Pismo Beach? Has anybody ever heard of that? Where you get a shovel and you dig into wet sand in some of the beaches in uh, the central California, digging for clams that have dug into the sand? Have you ever heard of that? Uh, incidentally, if you were to eat something called clam chowder, have you ever heard of that? What you're eating is this muscular foot. That's what you're eating. That's clam chowder. Uh, the, uh, and you might say, well, I'm not going to do that. Uh, well, has anybody ever heard of abalone? Abalone steak? Incidentally, that's very expensive at a seafood restaurant. An abalone looks just like this. It's like a big snail, and you're actually eating the muscular foot. Uh, Not, nobody's going to eat anything. Anymore, but, yes? What's the on top of the clam? Just uh, more of the parts sticking out there. We're not going to get into the details. Uh, now, the, uh, in the case of the muscular foot for the snail and the clam, it uses it for movement. The foot, in the case of an octopus or squid, has quote, had been adapted or evolved into tentacles. 
that it also uses for movement and even for almost in place of hands. So that's still the muscular foot. So that's what they all have in common, is this muscular foot that's basically adapted for movement. Now on the next page, uh, the, the uh, only thing I'm pointing out, this is a cutaway view of a snail. And uh, we had uh, mentioned uh, after, uh, when I lectured last time after the test, that uh, many of the animals that happen to be hermaphrodites, meaning both male and female, and the technical word is monoecious, there's just one type, are animals that move very slowly. Uh, so that, you know, after a snail on a rainstorm, rainy night, you know, it's out looking for sex and looking for action. And, uh, you know, if there was actually separate male and female snails, it might crawl, you know, for over three or four hours, it might have crawled ten inches. And uh, it would be terrible if it just ran into another snail of the wrong gender that it needs. So, in fact, any other snail will work. Notice down here, each one has both a penis and a vagina. And they basically will fertilize each other's eggs. And uh, let's see if I have a picture of that. Uh, all of these, uh, any pictures that I put out or show you are on another video. Yeah, here's, here's a picture of a couple of snails, right? Uh, they just uh, get together and they uh, each insert their penis into the other snail and then they lay these little eggs. So, uh, all right, so, and you'll notice up here, there's something called an ovotestes. So the main point is that they're hermaphrodites, or the word that we learned last time is monoecious. Monoecious means one type. Uh, we humans are dioecious. There are two types. You'd say, what do you mean two types of humans? There's male humans and female humans, right? The males don't understand the females, and the females don't understand the males. They're two different types of humans. But there's only one type of snail. Uh, the, uh, on page uh, of P3, on page P3, it just shows uh, an enlarged view of a, a clam. And again, I'm, a, I'm not going into all the internal anatomy, uh, but here it shows the muscular foot uh, that it uses to burrow into the sand. And I, I indicated here that the these are the bivalves. There are two halves to the clamshell. These include clams and mussels and scallops. Anybody ever eaten scallops? All right, oysters. And uh, most of the bivalves can be eaten. And so these are common you know, seafood uh, uh, meals. Now, uh, in terms of uh, the inside of these shells, uh, uh, and we've got some uh, shells out, including uh, abalone and so on. So it has on the inside, it's kind of iridescent. And, uh, it's, and what can form on the inside of the shell of these clams and oysters is a, calc a calcium carbonate mineral. Well, you know this better if I call it a pearl. So in other words, oysters are the source of pearls. So when you have a pearl necklace, that actually comes from oysters. Have you ever heard of that? And in Japan and other places in the Orient, they uh, the Far East, they actually have uh, oyster farms where they literally farm them for the purpose of having uh, these uh, pearls, to make pearls. So that's formed inside the shell. Uh, so that's uh, what I mentioned here. Uh, all right, now on the next page, P4, uh, this shows, uh, here we have a picture of an octopus and a squid. And this is something that's like an octopus or squid called a chambered nautilus. It really looks just like a squid, but it lives inside of a shell. So even these guys, some of them have shells and some of them don't. <clears throat> Incidentally, if you have an octopus, anybody want to guess how many tentacles it has? Eight. Eight. And in contrast, the squid has ten. Because you call it a decapus. And at the uh, bottom of the page, it shows two squids mating. Now, an octopus and a squid are, are really fascinating creatures because they, they're really, the, they're, they have pretty complex, and their nervous system is fairly complex, and they have a very sophisticated eye. They probably see pretty clearly uh, in terms of an, uh, the world, very much like we see it, uh, even though they're these somewhat primitive animals. Uh, that takes us to page P5, 
And on page P5, the segmented worms. All right, now what are the segmented worms? They're called segmented or annelids because they have all these body segments. And what we're really talking about are earthworms. So earthworms are in a different group category than flatworms, platyomythes, or roundworms, nematode. Uh, anytime we have repetition of body segments, that we call that metamerism. Metamerism. That means body segments. And I know you're probably saying, I can't even read what you wrote. You're so sloppy. Well, it's written better right up here. These segments are called metamerism having lots of repetition of body segments. All right, so that's the only thing I highlighted there, repetition of body segment. Now, uh, incidentally, you'll notice that on an earthworm, it's got all these body segments, and there's one segment right here that's kind of larger and smooth. I'm sure you've noticed that. That's called the clitellum. What's the clitellum for? For reproduction. That's where it releases. Now, earthworms, like snails, are hermaphrodites. And uh, the, each one, again, uh, two earthworms will come up side by side. Uh, let's show you how, what that looks like. There's two earthworms side by side. Incidentally, it takes them about three hours to kind of do this, so they really go slowly. And from the clitellum is where they release the sperm from. So the sperm are released uh, to, onto each other from the clitellum area, and they fertilize each other's eggs. This is the, uh, the clitellum is right here. All right, so here's the word clitellum. Now, for anybody who would like to dissect an earthworm today, on, on page P7, those who would like to may, but uh, whether, you, whether you dissect it or not, I want you to know just a little bit about the digestive system of an earthworm. That's it, even though I talk about uh, all the other parts of its body as well. So this is page P8. So earthworms, what do, first of all, what do earthworms feed on? Earthworms actually kind of eat dirt. They uh, eat dirt, and they like living in dirt where there's organic matter, because that's what they're living off of, is the organic matter in the soil. So you'd say, well, what's, what kind of organic matter? A anything. It could be uh, uh, bugs. It could be uh, fungus. It could be uh, uh, decomposing leaves, uh, uh, mulch. You know, uh, but it's got to live off some organic matter in the soil. Why earthworms are considered good for the soil is because as they move through the dirt, they kind of loosen it up. They aerate it so that it's not hard clay, but it's kind of loosened up. And that's why earthworms are considered good for uh, the soil. Uh, this is the parts of the, uh, in order of its digestive system. It has a mouth, which is right here. And then comes the pharynx. The word pharynx means throat. Then the esophagus. Then comes something called the crop, which is right here. And then the gizzard, that's right here. And then the intestine, which is here, and then the anus. So this is listed in order, and here it's labeled. So the, as it eats the food in the soil, it goes from the mouth, the pharynx, or throat. Now, I know that our first thought is, why are you telling us? Why do we need to know this? Uh, you know, I'm not saying this is the most important thing to know, but this is really, this name's bait. Most of these structures, with one or two exceptions, is the same as in our body, which we'll be learning next week. Do we have a mouth? Yes. Do we have a throat or pharynx? Yes. All right. Do we have uh, an esophagus? Yes. That's the food that carries uh, the pipe, the tube that carries food down to our stomach. We have an esophagus. Now, the earthworm has a crop and a gizzard and then the intestine. The, uh, we don't have a crop and a gizzard. We have something called a stomach that does what both the crop and the gizzard do together. A crop is used for storing food. A gizzard is used for grinding up the food. Our stomach does both. Our stomach is a big muscular sac that both stores the food and grinds it up. So what our stomach does is what a crop and gizzard do. Some of you might be thinking, like, doesn't a chicken have a gizzard also? Yes, it does. It has a crop and a gizzard. 
Okay, it doesn't have a stomach, it has a crop and a gizzard. So, so does an earthworm. The intestine is for the absorbing of nutrients. So that's the same in the earthworm and in us and in other animals. That's where nutrients are absorbed. So we, we'd like you to know that. All right, so that's the uh, earthworm. Incidentally, if you're thinking, you know, uh, Professor Frank, I would really like a picture of earthworms uh, mating. You have it on page P9. On the bottom of P9, there's a, your picture of earthworms mating. <clears throat> now, uh, we've mentioned the earthworm. Is there any other members? Is there any other members of segmented worms? And the answer is yes. On P11, at the bottom of P11, and again, anything I skip, you can skip. But I'd like you to know what a leech is. You ever heard of leeches? A leech is a member, it is related, it's a cousin of the earthworm. It's got all these body segments, just like an earthworm. It doesn't have a clitella. It is a parasite, though. It has a mouth at one end that it uses to suck blood and uh, an anus at the other end. It is an ectoparasite. Now, an ectoparasite is a parasite that lives on your surface of your body, not inside you. So a tapeworm is a parasite inside you. A leech is a parasite that attaches to you. Now, they, everybody knows leeches from various movies. So, you know, Rambo, if you ever watched Rambo, you know, he's pulling the leeches off his body when he's chomping to go through the jungle. Uh, there's a very famous old movie from the 40s of uh, uh, Humphrey Bogart and Catherine Hepburn, you know, an African queen where they're pulling leeches off. So uh, they've appeared in uh, stars in many movies. If you uh, look on page P12, here's a, an act, another picture of a leech. Again, they are ectoparasites. And there's an article you can read about called Return of the Bloodsuckers. And they actually use leeches in medicine. Did you know that? Yes. Yeah, they actually put leeches on people who've had surgery. And that's to basically uh, act as an anticoagulant and to help blood circulation. And the, anything you want to say there? Right. They actually have a bottle of leeches that they will pull out of the bottle and put them on the person's body. All right? So that's what they're talking about. And the scientific name of these leeches is Herudo medicinalis. And in fact, they have a long history of being used. Uh, in the time of the Wild West, you know, cowboys and all that, so, you know, sometimes they get in a fighting match, you know, and we're saying maybe you got two cowboys who are actually married and have to go home to their wives and they got into a fight at the bar. So usually uh, the person who was both the doctor and the uh, barber, you know, usually the barber was also the doctor out in the Wild West. They didn't have a lot of medical doctors. They usually had a bottle of leeches. So it's what they, where they had bruises, where they got all bruised, a bruise is where you're bleeding. They put a leech right there. It would suck up the blood so you wouldn't go home with all these bruises and a black eye. Black eye is a bruise. So the leech would go and suck the blood up, and that way your wife wouldn't throw something at you for getting into another fist fight at the bar. But uh, so they have a very interesting history. You can read about it. Um, OK, on page, uh, we'll just go drop further, and then we'll take a break. And then we'll give you a chance to look at the specimens, and then I'll finish this up. But on P13, let me just begin this on P13. On P13, and in case you're thinking, is this ever going to end? Yeah, there's only uh, two, uh, uh, two more phyla of invertebrates. Uh, the, uh, this one, phylum arthropoda. So I'm just going to mention it, and we'll take a break. Arthropoda. The word arthro means joints, like arthritis. And poda means foot, like podiatrist, joint-footed. The joint-footed animals, these are actually very important. Now, so far, I've only asked you to know the names of the phylums. This is the only phylum of invertebrate animals that I'm going to ask you to know three classes, because they're so important. So the, the classes, and there are a whole bunch of classes. I'm only going to ask you to know three, because we divide phylums into classes. Class Crustacea. 
class Arachnida and class Insecta. So who are they? The crustaceans. And we use that word in English. The crustaceans are the names for lobsters, crabs, and shrimp. At a seafood restaurant on the menu, it will say crustaceans. Uh, so these, they look like this. They have jointed legs. The arachnids. The arachnids are the spiders and scorpions. There was a movie a number of years ago called Arachnophobia. And then there's the insects. So these are all related. Now, there are other uh, classes of arthropoda uh, that we're not going to talk about, including centipedes and millipedes. Uh, and you may have heard of an ancient, extinct group of arthropods called trilobites. So if you ever heard of these fossils called trilobites, that's an extinct group. I'm not asking you to know them. Uh, on the uh, bottom part here, we uh, pointed out just before the break that three-fourths of all the animals, the species of animals, are in phylum arthropoda. That's why it's so important. Uh, and uh, now, they also exhibit uh, what's called metamorism. And I mentioned that word earlier. Earthworms, I mentioned, have metamorism. The, right? The earthworms, all those little body segments, right? They're called segmented worms. This is a model of a grasshopper. Look at these segments. So evolutionary biologists believe that basically an ancestor to the modern earthworm uh, became adapted and evolved into the arthropods, which have this same kind of segmentation. See that? It looks very much like the segmentation of the earthworms. The only big difference, there's a number of differences, but one of the big differences, it's got legs and the earthworm doesn't. All right, so that's a, it's also got metamorism. So that's the, uh, what we mean by that. Uh, and uh, they, their bodies are divided into three parts, usually. Uh, a, uh, 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 three body regions, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. And incidentally, we have a head, a thorax, a chest, and an abdomen. Uh, they, they are characterized by having jointed appendages. That's why they're called arthropoda, which means jointed legs. And they have a hard outer skin called an exoskeleton. When you feel, for those of you who would like to feel the outside of a grasshopper or a beetle, or how about this, many of you have eaten crabs, so the outer skin, you know, that's, we call that a shell. It's not a shell, right? You know what shells are. That's like where those abalones are. Those are shells. They're made out of calcium. That thing that you call the shell of a lobster is a hard outer skin. It's an outer skin, not a real shell. Uh, people collect shells. They don't collect the outer skins of crabs or lobsters. It's not a shell. So uh, you'd say, well, they, yeah, but they call them shellfish. Yeah, actually, they, that word doesn't make any sense at all because they don't have a shell and they're not fish. Okay, that's just a term that people use. So uh, this is called an exoskeleton. An exoskeleton is like an outer suit of armor. It's just a, a, a hard outer skin. Uh, and uh, on page P14, again, just focusing on what I've underlined, what I've highlighted, the other stuff you can skip, the way that arthropods grow, the way that insects grow, and spiders grow, and, and lobsters, and, and crabs grow, is they actually have to shed their outer skin, and then they grow larger and secrete or form a new, a new outer skin. So they molt. They shed that outer skin. Sometimes you may have run into something that looked like a spider, and it looked like it was dead. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it's like you thought it was a spider and it wasn't. What had the spider done to shed its outer skin? Anybody know what I'm talking about? And all you saw was the outer skin, and it walked away and grew a, a new outer skin, bigger. So uh, that's what they do. Uh, they are dioecious. That means two types. There's males and females among uh, grasshoppers and among uh, most animals. Most animals are not uh, uh, hermaphrodites. Um, the uh, insects and these other arthropods and most of these other animals that we've spoken of so far today, they can exhibit very complex behavior. Uh, insects go through all kinds of complex behavior, but it's all instinctive. It's all genetically programmed or innate. 
They do not learn anything. You can't teach uh, an uh, insect to do anything. It simply follows a program. So, for example, when you look at the behavior of bees in a hive, or the behavior of ants in an ant colony, they're all doing all kinds of things, but they're just, it's all instinctive. It's all innate. They don't ha do anything. In, they don't say, oh, you know, I'm going to try it this way for a change. All they do is operate instinctively. Now, one of the challenges we have as humans is that we don't have a, as much instinctive behavior. Sometimes I, I've reflected on this. You know, if we, didn't, if we didn't have kind of, quote, pornographic pictures, if we didn't have movies of, you know, how you, quote, do it, uh, I don't know if we could figure it out because it's not all that instinctive. We, we know kind of we have an urge, we've got to do stuff, but we're not really sure all the, of all the technique. Uh, insects don't have to worry about technique. They just do it. It's all genetically programmed. But, you know, so that's why we read books and we go to movies and we get some new ideas of what to try. So we experiment. <laughs> so we have the ability to change and modify our behavior and learn. Uh, but we, sometimes we don't have that instinctive behavior of what to just do automatically. Um, okay, on page, uh, we're skipping P15 on P... Actually, the bottom of P15. Let's go to the bottom of P15. On the very bottom of P15, uh, cl uh, class Arachnida. The arachnids are the spiders, the scorpions, the daddy long legs, and the ticks and the mites. And uh, what is the definition of an arachnid, of a spider or a scorpion or a tick or a mite? They have eight walking legs. Eight walking legs. On the next page, you can see pictures of these guys. So you can see a spider, you can see a tick, and a mite, and a scorpion, and they all have eight walking legs. That's what uh, defines the arachnids. Now, they are all carnivores, they're all meat eaters, and uh, some of them even have poison glands, such as spiders and so on, and scorpions, uh, to kill their prey. Sometimes we can uh, be bitten by a spider or a scorpion. Uh, on the uh, next page, uh, page P17, uh, I'll just make a, a brief comment about the black widow spider. Certainly don't have to know its scientific name. Uh, the, how do you recognize a black widow spider? Well, I talk about recognizing that it has an, or at least the female has an orange hourglass on its underside. You can see this actually on the next page, P18. On the bottom of P18, on the bottom of P18, so this shows the male, and the female is larger than the male. In the insect world, the female is usually larger than the male in the insect world. Uh, the female on her belly has a kind of an a orange hourglass, kind of a superhero emblem. Now, I do not recommend you pick up spiders to flip them over and see, you know, if they are or, or are not a black widow spider. Uh, th that's the common poisonous spider that is found here in California. There are worse spiders than that, uh, than bla the black widow, but it is the poisonous spider that tends to be around here. Tarantulas don't really live so much here, and they don't really, they, they don't uh, poison anybody. Um, so uh, some people even have tarantulas as pets. But uh, the, the Black Widow can. And how it gets the name Black Widow, as some of you might know, is uh, after the ma female and male mate, um, she doesn't need him anymore. And she eats him. Because she's got to have energy to lay eggs. So she becomes a widow. That's, uh, I mean, you don't need the guy anymore. All right, so um, anyhow, the, uh, one other comment about spider webs. So again, uh, insects are, are, have this instinctive or innate behavior. So different spiders create different shaped webs. Uh, that's all instinctive. The web is actually made up of a protein. And in the, even though to us the web seems kind of flimsy, uh, the thinness of the actual web threads, that protein thread, if you could have steel as thin, if you could form steel as thin as a, a thread of a web, the wet thread of a web is stronger than steel. If you could have steel that thin. 
And so when a fly flies into it, it's like flying into a brick wall, or if you were that size of a fly. So when it gets caught in that web. Um, okay, and then it eats it. Uh, the, the spider eats it. Now, on page P19, on P19, uh, the next class is class crustacea. Who are the crustaceans? Those are the crabs, the lobsters, the crayfish or crawfish. <clears throat> Incidentally, what is a crayfish? A crayfish is a freshwater lobster. In other words, if it lives in the ocean, it's called a lobster. If it lives in a river, it's called a crayfish or a crawdad. That's basically very similar. Uh, shrimp, barnacles, and sow bugs are all crustaceans. The definition is they have 10 or more legs. 10 or more legs. How many legs does a spider or scorpion have? Eight. Eight. So, like, should we know that difference? Yes. So uh, you can count the legs. Here's a crab, here's a crayfish, here's a prawn, which is a type of shrimp. Uh, you'd say, what are pill bugs? Uh, people call them roly polies. Those are those guys, you know, you kind of roll on the cement there on the sidewalk, you play marbles with them. They, they're actually related to the uh, crabs. They're one of the few of the crustaceans that live on land. And a barnacle. Uh, what's actually inside of a barnacle is something that looks like a shrimp. And it lives inside there, it doesn't leave. And uh, here on the bottom is just an enlarged picture. You can see the 10 uh, or more pairs of legs that are found in crustaceans. On the next page, this is showing uh, a kind of internal view of uh, barnacles. So uh, again, what's inside the barnacle is something that looks like a shrimp. You can see right here. Um, incidentally, this uh, bottle is out on display, and it's on my video. Uh, so I've actually asked the following question right next to the bottle. It first asks, and obviously what we can see is a crab here. Everybody recognizes a crab. And what's attached on the surface of the crab is it has some barnacles attached. So I've asked the question on the paper, so what phylum is, and class is the crab? Phylum arthropoda, it's got jointed legs, class crustacean, it's a crustacean. And then I asked, well, what phylum and class are the barnacles? The exact same thing. Uh, arthropoda, we just said, a barnacle is like a shrimp inside it. So uh, it's uh, phylum arthropoda class crustacean. So it's the same answer. That's what's attached on that crab. <clears throat> Not all crabs have barnacles attached, but this one does. Uh, on page P21, on page P21, that takes us to the third and final class of the arthropods, the class ins insecta. There are more species of insects than all the other species of all the other animals combined. We're so glad that there are so many insects on this planet. Over 800,000 species. So the reason why the arthropoda are the largest phylum is simply because there's so many insects in that phylum. There's really insects are the biggest group. Now, we wrote that insects represent man's greatest competitors for food on this planet because every time they plant crops, they have to spray with insecticides or the insects will eat everything. Occasionally, you'll hear about these stories, and they use the word that's like biblical. They'll call it a locust. That's where there's a, just a massive numbers of grasshoppers or insects they just basically fly or come into a field, and they eat everything down to the earth. And there's absolutely no food, nothing left. Right? And, and that does happen, and, and that's why they use insecticides, so that it doesn't happen. They kill the insects. So even though we all would like to have food without insecticides, they just can't produce large amounts of food without using it, because the insects are our greatest competitors for food. Furthermore, uh, insects may transmit various diseases. We know that an a animal, an organism that transmits a disease, it's not the cause of the disease, but transmits it, is called a vector. 
So what, uh, how, what transmits malaria, which is a protozoan parasite, is a mosquito. The mosquito is not the cause of malaria, but it transmits it from one person to another. Being bitten by a mosquito or flies transmits the disease. So they're vectors of malaria, of African sleeping sickness, of yellow fever. But there's also good insects. You'd say, yeah, we name one. How about bees? Because without bees, not only would there not be honey, but they pollinate all the flowering plants. And there's other uh, good uh, insects uh, besides uh, bees as well. Uh, now, uh, insects, like other arthropods, have an outer skin, an exoskeleton. Uh, they have a head, a chest, or thorax, and an abdomen. And they are characterized by having six walking legs. So how many legs does a spider have? Eight. How many uh, legs does a crab have? Ten. How many legs does an insect have? Six. So now you know the difference between these things, at least one of their differences. Many of the insects, not all, but many have two pairs of wings. Uh, now, most insects, uh, they, uh, they undergo a change uh, called metamorphosis. But some it's a subtle metamorphosis, and some it's a dramatic metamorphosis. Uh, incidentally, as far as these legs, I just summarized this here at the bottom, but you've already got it. Arachnids, eight. Crustaceans, ten or more. Insects, six. But anyhow, uh, look on the next page, P22. Here's what we mean. Uh -huh. Let's first look at how uh, grasshoppers grow. So they, the little grasshopper, it's cute, uh, hatches it from an egg, and it grows larger, and it sheds its outer skin, it molts, grows larger, sheds its outer skin and molts, grows bigger, sheds its outer skin and molts, and basically by repeating molting, it grows and becomes a big grasshopper. This, uh, this is an adult grasshopper. This is called direct development, direct development. Now, on the right, it's labeled indirect development. What's hatching from these eggs is a caterpillar. The caterpillar, C-A-T-E-R, let's just ignore that. It's not a carter pillar, caterpillar. All right, so uh, the caterpillar, like the grasshopper, uh, grows and then it sheds its outer skin, it molts, it grows, it sheds its outer skin, that's called molting. But at some point, it forms a, a cocoon around itself. It forms a cocoon around itself and it undergoes a dramatic metamorphosis, a dramatic change in shape where it changes from a caterpillar to a flying a butterfly or moth, or fly. So uh, a, a butterflies uh, are really caterpillars that change into butterflies, and same with moths. And as far as flies, if you have me for lecture, we talked about maggots. Have you ever seen these white maggots crawling out of trash cans? Those, are, those will metamorphosize into flies. So uh, that, this is a dramatic metamorphosis. That's called indirect development. All right, on page P23, P23. Uh, now, anybody would like to, nobody asked me about dissecting an earthworm today, but if you still want to, you can, either today or next time. Uh, also, if you want to dissect a grasshopper, you can. Uh, but I'm just going to make a few, just a few things I'd like you to know about a grasshopper, whether you dissect it or not. So uh, the, uh, most insects, including the grasshopper, have these large eyes called compound eyes. Now, uh, what is a compound eye? A compound eye is actually hundreds of little eyes. So they, when they look at the world, they don't see one world. They see hundreds of images. And some of these little eyes that are in this compound eye are facing forward. Some are pointing up. Some are pointing backwards. That's why when you try to sneak up to swat a fly, it probably sees you and it flies away before you're able to swing the fly swatter. Because it's this compound eye is hundreds of eyes pointing in all different directions. If you ever saw any of the fly movies, you remember the guy who gets caught in the transporter be, uh, uh, device with the fly? So they try to create the illusion as if what it looks like to see with compound eyes, multiple images. Um, all right, now, as far as uh, at the bottom, 
So here's a picture of, uh, uh, of a grasshopper. Uh, here's the important thing I want you to know. This is the mouth. You say, okay, I knew that. It uses its mouth only for eating. You'd say, okay, that makes sense. Because here on the sides of the a grasshopper, there are little holes called spiracles. That's how it breathes. It breathes air through these openings on the sides of its body, through its spiracles. So, you know, we can eat, use our mouth for eating and breathing. It does not breathe through its mouth, and it has no nose. All right? It breathes through these holes on the sides of its body. Just thought I'd point that out. And uh, you can see, again, these body segments. On page uh, P24 at the bottom, on the bottom of P24, we mention how to tell the difference between a male and a female grasshopper, which is pretty much the way you, all, all the insects work. At the back of the room, I put out, I pulled out a male and female grasshopper. It's also on the video that you can watch at home. This model that I'm holding up right now, this is a female grasshopper. If you look right here, can you see the back, the end of it is like this. This can open or close. It's shown right here. This is called the ovipositor. And it lays its eggs right here. Notice the male. It's just a rounded end. It doesn't have this ovipositor where it deposits the eggs at the end. And you can see the actual grasshoppers and uh, tell the difference between a female and a female. Uh, the, uh, on the next page on P25, so uh, you can add to your collection of sex pictures. Uh, here's a male riding the female. And again, the, uh, in the insect world, the female is usually larger than the male in the insect world. So he gets on her, and he rides her, and then he uh, releases sperm into her body. Has anybody ever seen like insects, like, uh, for example, dragonflies flying, and they're mating while they're flying? You know, sometimes you don't see these things, not because they don't exist, but you don't, didn't even think to look for it. So the more you know about the world, for example, now when you look at a pine tree, you may notice the, not only the female cones, but the male cones. Until you knew there were such a thing called nail codes, you wouldn't have been looking for it. Um, on page, uh, uh, let's jump to page uh, P28. On P28, the last phylum of invertebrate animals on P28 are echinodermata. The word echinodermata literally means spiny skinned animals. They have spiny skin. And uh, not only does a starfish have spiny skin, look at this guy, the sea urchin, which has got big spines. Now we wrote uh, the uh, echinoderms include the starfish or sea star, the sea urchin, the sand dollar. And uh, we'll show you a picture of a sand dollar. It kind of has the emblem of a starfish on it. And a sea cucumber. These also have radial symmetry. The only two phylum of animals that have radial symmetry are uh, the selenerates, that's like the sea anemones and the jellyfish, and the echinoderms. They have radial symmetry. Why do we say that a starfish has radial symmetry? Because it has five arms. You cannot cut an animal in half into two equal halves because five is not divisible by two. If I cut it in half, one half has three arms, the other has two. It's organized not bilaterally, but radial symmetry, like the spokes of a wheel. Most animals have bilateral symmetries, we learned last time we lectured. Um, on page uh, P30, on page P30, again, anything I skip, you do not need to know. Now, there's no law you can't look at it, but I won't test you either. This is showing a starfish. I don't know how many of you have ever seen a starfish up close or in an aquarium, but if you turn them on the underside, they actually have hundreds of these little tube feet. Has anybody ever seen that? And they actually are all moving, and they act like little suction cups. And because they act like little suction cups, the starfish can crawl right up a glass, you know, the, a, a glass wall of an aquarium tank. Right? It's got all these little tube feet on the underside. That's how it moves. 
On uh, page uh, P31, uh, a, sand, uh, a sea urchin is also clearly an echinoderm with a spiny skin and a sand dollar, but a uh, sand dollar is just a, a, a living thing uh, and it's got the emblem of a kind of a starfish on it. It's another echinoderm. 